do you ever think Sunderland is a gloomy, depressing place with no history? Well, think again, because today we're exploring Sunnyside, an area of Sunderland which is underrated for its historic gems. Sunnyside is to the east of the city centre, so we're crossing over Fawcett Street and heading down High Street East, past Mackey's Corner. The High Street runs all the way from Sunderland Empire and Primark, across Fawcett Street and down towards the docks. At over half a mile long, it's longer than Newcastle's Northumberland Street. Once the home of premium shops where you could buy just about anything, it's now an area crying out for investment. As we come to this junction, we can take a peek up John Street to look at the old Joblin's department store building, where Santa's grotto will be magical and the big sales were legendary. To our left is a restaurant with an interesting facade, resembling a church. The early Gothic Revival building, designed by Thomas Moore in 1850, is most commonly referred to as an old registry office, however has some earlier darker history. The officers were responsible for groups within the parish, electing a board of guardians who would provide relief for the residents in the workhouses. Workhouses were a last resort for the poor, who often did tedious jobs in exchange for a roof over their head. Heading deeper into the east of the city centre, modern entertainment complexes come into view. The Lyceum Theatre stood where the Grosvenor Casino stands today, being an impressive Victorian theatre that Charles Dickens performed Not So Bad As We Seem in 1852. He was so anxious about performing at the newly built theatre, he was not able to eat, to drink anything or stir from his room. The Sunnyside Quarter of Sunderland is now more recognisable for its lively nightlife, but was once the epicentre of Sunderland's power as a shipbuilding centre. In the Victorian era, it was more bowler hats and important shipping meetings as opposed to cheesy chips and a night on the tiles. The old post office sits in the centre of Sunnyside, built in 1903 in a Renaissance style by Henry Tanner. Henry Tanner was the government architect of the day and designed a number of post office buildings in the UK. It was a grand space and probably positioned in the centre of the busy business district on purpose to take the huge amount of correspondence through letter and phone of the great businesses in the terraced houses surrounding Sunnyside. It even had a department specially made for the newly invented telephone. You had to be careful crossing the roads in the days of the old post office though. General post office vans whizzed around at speed, delivering telegrams through at all cost. I've always loved these two corner buildings in 40 and 42 West Sunnyside, with their circular towers that jut out a little bit like lighthouses. The red and yellow striped building, 40 West Sunnyside, is now a hairdresser's, but seems to have been a shipping company owned by an Alexander Smith from the latter half of the 19th century. Listings and newspapers of the time advertised the ships as requiring very little to be sea ready, literally sitting in the river for a buyer. 
Despite a wealthy reputation, a story in the Sunderland Echo referencing 40 West Sunnyside caught my eye. The mystery of disappearing crew aboard the bark Dorothy Thompson in 1880. The ship was part owned by Mr Smith and seems to have sunk whilst on its journey from Shields to Cam. Across the road at number 42 is a little bit less exciting. 42 West Sunnyside was the home of different financial and ship related companies. T.E. Briars, a solicitor, had offices here, as did James Curry & Co, who operated steamships for the Leithshire Newcastle Steam Packet Company, as well as operating their international shipping company, the Curry Line. As the largest shipbuilding town in the world, Sunderland needed offices for those keeping the ships moving with the terraced houses in West Sunnyside Street and Norfolk Street being full of busy people. William Jamieson laid out some plans in 1814 to create greenery and attract middle-class residents to live closer to Sunnyside's commercial area. Being able to work closer to home was an attraction even then. The open space in the centre of Sunnyside around the old post office became what was known as the shrubbery in 1821 being an area of beautiful gardens that complemented the rich heritage buildings and the boom of the coal and shipping industries at the time. Just opposite the old post office is a quiet street of houses with a surprising claim to fame. The birthplace of Charles William Alcock, one of the founders of the FA Cup. Charles William Alcock was born here in 1842 in 10 Norfolk Street, the son of a shipbuilder and owner. The Alcock family moved a few streets down to John Street by the 1851 census and then the family moved to Essex. Charles and his elder brother developed a passion for football, forming the Forest Football Club in 1859. Alcock was a pioneer of how the modern universal football game runs today, understanding the benefit of playing football with teamwork. Before this time, teams had different rules, creating chaos on the pitch. In 1870, Charles organised and played the first international football match between England and Scotland, with the FA tournament being created in 1871. A few doors down at number 5 Norfolk Street is this beautiful sandstone house that looks quite out of place compared to the rest of the architecture. This was the home of W.M. St. John, who were family wine merchants. From 25-year-old liqueur whiskey to brandy, this seemed to be the place to go for a Victorian party. We turn back into a section of High Street, which has changed a lot in recent years, including the demolishment of Sunderland department store favourite, Liverpool House. Boasting the best Santa in town, Liverpool House was in its heyday in the 1950s and 60s, alongside the other famous Sunderland department stores at the time. It was demolished in the 2010s to make room for other developments. A clue to our seafaring past is on the shopfront on High Street West. After generations of ship broken within the property, A.G. Gibbons set up their butchers and ship chandeliers here in 1936. They provided preserved salted meat to be consumed by the ship's crew on both long and short voyages, keeping tummies fed away from home. Depictions of Greek goddesses, kings and men's heads can be seen on the shop front above, possibly from ship figureheads from a disused ship. Continue down High Street West and can see another historic gem on the other side of the road. 
a short row of late 18th century merchant houses that were converted into shops. The shop where Pop Rex is today was where the iconic Harrods of the North Bins department store began. Draper George Bins occupied one of the houses in 1811 until his death in 1836. His son Henry oversaw a move to 173 High Street West, moving with the trend of Sunderland's commercial centre of town moving west. Following Sunderland's boom in port and industrial trades, the store was moved again at this time to 38 and 39 Forster Street in 1884, one of the main shopping street destinations at the time. Did you know that deep under Villiers Street there's an underground crypt? Burying the dead was a religious process in the Georgian and Victorian eras, with people who had a different religion to their area's place of worship being unwelcome. In the 1960s, an underground crypt was found near Villiers Street, containing the remains of 408 people who were part of the 9th century nonconformist Bethnal Church that once stood near this area. Discovered again in 2010, when construction work was underway here, the crypt which was the final resting place for many, was then sealed off to the public forever. Towards the middle of Villiers Street we can see St George's Presbyterian Chapel, dating from 1825. It was part of the Villiers Street Junior Technical School and is now part of the Remake Culture Project. Next door to the church is a Victorian Jewish synagogue in Beth Hamidrash, which is like a house of study, which opened in 1899 for 200 men and 70 women. This building was set up due to tensions between differences in tradition, culture, background and standards of religious observation in the growing Jewish community in Sunderland. Due to a growth in congregation, the Beth Hamidrash was extended in 1920 and then again in 1933. However, due to members living closer to Morbury Road in the southwest of the city centre, a new synagogue in Beth Hamidrash was consecrated in February 1938. At the bottom of Foyle Street was one of Sunderland's first temperance hotels, offering bed and breakfast but without a single drop of alcohol. The Osborne Temperance Hotel was one of several popular temperance hotels in the country during the Victorian and Edwardian eras. This one even offered healthcare cures to ailments including flat feet and joint dislocations. The faded ghost sign above the building gives a clue to the building's hidden history. We turn into Foyle Street to see the home of Sunderland's first female MP, Dr Marion Phillips constituency. Dr Marion Phillips came to power during the first election where women under the age of 30 could vote in 1929. This election, which had been nicknamed the Flappers election, was incredibly important for the rights of women, giving a lot of women the power to vote and write for the very first time. Before being elected as MP, Marion was leader of the Women's Labour League in 1911, promoting the representation of women in Parliament, fighting the cause for the vote for women. She was really passionate about the politics of women and the working class from the start 
becoming Labour's first Chief Woman Officer in 1918, a role she retained to her death. The cobbled foil street is often used for period dramas, a claim to fame for this rare glimpse into the industrial past of Sunderland. We end our Sunnyside Sunderland tour at one of the most important buildings in the city, the building where Sunderland AFC was formed. Formerly the Norfolk Hotel, the building was home to the British Day School, who played host to a teachers meeting in 1879. This meeting was ultimately led to the formation of Sunderland AFC, originally known as the Sunderland and District Teachers Association. James Allen, a Scottish school teacher who taught at Hendon Board School, had discovered the round ball game despite rugby being the most popular game in Sunderland at the time. Most teachers at the school were unmarried women, so there was a lack of men for Allen to form into a team to play football. As teachers started to learn about the game, teams started to be organised and Saturdays were spent in practices. And sure enough, there was a squad ready to face the stern opposition. I really hope you liked this little tour of the amazing sunny side in Sunderland. Please give me a like and a subscribe if you'd like to see more tours like this and let me know where we should go next. <laughs>